This is the New England Journal of Medicine COVID-19 update for November 4th, 2020. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the Journal, and I'm talking with Eric Rubin, Editor-in-Chief, and Lindsay Baden, Deputy Editor. Eric and Lindsay, here we are the morning after the presidential election, and it's not yet clear who's won. But no matter who it is, they're going to be facing the continuing challenge of a poorly controlled epidemic. Let's look today at where we stand and what the prospects are for some of the current strategies to control the epidemic. Looking first at the high-tech end, there are several vaccines in late clinical trials. What have we learned about those potential vaccines, and when are we going to hear more? I think it's important to start by saying, Steve, that the path toward development of vaccines has been incredibly impressive, no matter what the ultimate outcome of these efforts are. Remember that in the past, it's generally taken a decade or more to develop and test a vaccine and get it through the regulatory process for approval. And the current efforts didn't start until early spring. And we're already in deep phase three testing. So whatever the outcome, this is a real testament to the companies, to the academic centers, and the scientific leadership within the NIH and the FDA to get us to this point. Right now, there are various modalities for delivering vaccines, but the antigens are pretty limited to a single antigen, the viral spike protein. There are good reasons to use the spike protein, but one must remember that it's possible that other antigens could contribute and they are not being explored, at least in the late stage development. The spike protein has been introduced in various ways as a purified protein, encapsulated in another virus, or encoded in messenger RNA. And for each one of these, there are multiple versions so that there are many opportunities for success. I'd say that so far, there have been several positives. Many of these candidates make very good antibody responses, and some produce the kind of T-cell response that might be effective in preventing infection. Although the non-human primate models don't really replicate human disease, at least a couple of vaccines have been shown to produce some amount of protection in these animals. And at least for some of these vaccines, there has been little evidence of safety problems, at least as far as we've heard, in ongoing trials. This doesn't apply to all of them because there have been a couple that have had clinical holds, but we don't know too much about what was involved there. But of course, we're missing the big key here, which is any evidence of efficacy in humans. And we're not going to know whether or not these work until we have a sufficient number of infections to measure that efficacy. So the good news right now is also the bad news. With the rate of infection rising, the timeline to getting an answer might be getting shorter. One thing that I'd add is it's important to remember that at least in the US, we're placing pretty much all of our bets on vaccines to end the pandemic. At this point, there's really no plan B. So if they don't work, we will be scrambling. Eric, you've covered a broad swath of development over the last 10 months since this pandemic started. And of the issues that you raise, there are several that I think are worth highlighting. Even if there is a vaccine, I'm not convinced that that should be looked at as the only answer. And that should a vaccine be developed that works, it likely should be deployed in the context of the other prevention modalities that we've all been discussing, from distancing to masks to hand washing. You know, just because one wears a seatbelt in the car and has airbags doesn't mean you shouldn't drive safely, awake, not intoxicated. So I think that we need to think carefully about layering beneficial modalities rather than betting the whole transmission dynamic on a single modality. Having said that, the hope is a vaccine will be tremendously effective like the measles vaccine and have a dominant effect on breaking the back of transmission. But I think we have to be cautious about assuming that that's all we need, uh, particularly early on as things go to scale and we understand the impact. Yeah, I agree, absolutely, Lindsay. And remember too that we kind of hope for the magic vaccine that is perfectly effective and perfectly safe, but that's unlikely to be the case. There will be some safety issues, there always are. How severe they'll be, we'll see. And at least for other respiratory viruses, our vaccines are far from perfect. So it's certainly possible that they will have some limited efficacy. And if so, they won't be perfect at reducing transmission. So we really should have other things in our back pocket. And I think, as you say, Eric, 
if there's efficacy, then we will exploit that by deploying the vaccine. But I think we need to discuss for a moment what efficacy looks like. Is efficacy prevention of severe illness, prevention of mild to moderate illness, prevention of asymptomatic transmission, prevention of transmission in general? And I think that there may be different sides of efficacy with different degrees of activity, 90% effective for one, 30% for another, maybe ineffective for another parameter. So I think we're gonna have to carefully understand whatever the efficacy signals are, and then translate that into how do we benefit from a public health standpoint. But I think we need to be careful about thinking efficacy is one single event that resolves whatever it is I'm worried about as an individual in society. And so the data will help us understand what does efficacy mean and how well does the vaccine help achieve that? And in fact, the FDA in recent guidance put out a comment that they wanted to make sure that in the placebo group, there is at least five severe cases. The concept being that in order to show something doesn't happen, in the placebo group or the comparator group, the events need to happen to be able to demonstrate the prevention of those events. So I think it might not be as simple as we all hope it will be with a very clean, efficacious result. But again, we shall see as the data emerge. It's a good point. And I agree absolutely with everything except your very last statement that we'll see as the data emerge. One of the problems that we face, and this is not a simple one, is that there's a lot of time pressure on approving a vaccine. And it's very likely that when it gets approved, we're not going to know all the parameters that you're talking about, Lindsay. That's a problem. On the other hand, not having a vaccine is a problem. So there's a bit of a catch-22 here. We want to save lives and prevent transmission and prevent disease. At the same time, we want to know more about how we should be properly using these vaccines. And that is going to be a real struggle for the community, scientifically, public health, just individuals trying to get back to normal daily activity and reopen society, is how comfortable are we with the data that are available to date, realizing that with 50 to 100,000 known new infections per day in this country, one to 2,000 deaths per day, that we can't wait one to three years for perfect data. But in one to three months, we'll have uncertainty that we'll have to manage. And even safety, we're going to have to carefully think about because by definition, the amount of safety we're gonna have will be several months worth in 10, 20,000 individuals. And that is very valuable, but it doesn't tell us about hundreds of thousands to millions of individuals or years later. And so we're also gonna have to manage the uncertainties given the amount of safety data we have at the time that we see efficacy, hopefully, and have to make these important judgments about what is overall beneficial. So in the absence, at least for the moment, of an effective vaccine, what are things looking like in terms of treatment? There have been a lot of trials at this point, and we've had some good news. I think, once again, that we want to point out the important successes that we've already had in this area. At the beginning, we were both concerned, and we mentioned it repeatedly in the podcast at the beginning of the outbreak, that a lot of treatments were being used off-label and not within clinical trials. And that meant we couldn't really understand whether or not they're working. But that has changed to a great extent, not completely. And now we have an explosion of data. We have many randomized controlled trials that are giving us information. And many of them have been negative, unfortunately. But negative trials are really important in this context, too, because they keep us from putting people at risk with therapies that are not beneficial. We're still having some problems with testing. For example, it's hard to tell the benefit of convalescent plasma because of the emergency use authorization that has been granted to it. A lot of people are receiving it outside of clinical trials, and it's been very difficult to enroll people in these clinical trials. It's certainly a difficult situation. This is exactly the kind of outbreak that Congress envisioned when it created emergency use authorizations for the FDA. So they should be using them in this case. But in some cases, clearly they've been using them a little too early before we have any idea of whether something has efficacy. That all being said, we do have a couple of drugs that have benefit. 
thus far, the only drug that's had benefit in the early phase of illness is remdesivir. The early phase of illness, of course, is dominated by viral replication, and remdesivir is a direct acting antiviral drug. And we have one well done RCT that shows remdesivir shortens the course of disease, although it has a limited impact, if any, on survival. There's an additional study that's only available in preprint right now, which looked at death as an endpoint, and it reinforces the idea that remdesivir is probably not a miracle drug and that it has very little effect on the outcome of death. In patients with later disease, we know, however, that the corticosteroid dexamethasone does reduce death rates, at least according to one large RCT. Again, it's not a miracle drug, but it has a clear benefit. There are several more drugs that are being studied. I'd say that hopes are probably highest for monoclonal antibodies, which are also being used as a sort of antiviral. So far, we've only got published data from one early trial in which there were some signals that led the developers to move on to a phase three trial, even though the agent failed the primary endpoint. We've heard that the phase three trial of this agent was designed in two arms, one for early disease and one for late disease, and the late disease arm has been stopped, presumably because it didn't work. But that's not very surprising because we see these agents as being primarily useful in early disease, and we'll see what happens as the trial goes on. But I think there's one big takeaway from therapeutics, which is there are no game changers right now. There don't appear to be any on the near horizon. And these agents have little or no effect on transmission of disease. So they're not going to stop the epidemic. Right now, our best hope is that they improve symptoms and save lives. I mean, the emergence of therapeutics over the last six to 10 months is, as you've said, Eric, quite remarkable. But we have to be careful how we manage hope, desperation, uncertainty, and we have to take great care in overinterpreting anecdotes. You know, the history of medicine, unfortunately, shows that what we believe or think should be true is not always true. Postmenopausal estrogen, one RCT about 20 years ago demonstrated that all the cohort studies were wrong. There was a healthy participant effect. Peanuts, don't give peanuts to your kid until they're old enough, one RCT, and all of a sudden we realize earlier peanuts may be better. Same thing in oncology with mastectomies versus lumpectomies, that when we do high quality trials, we realize what we think was true is not always true. And biology is complicated and the biology of COVID is quite complicated. And over the last 10 months, a tremendous amount of effort has gone into understanding this biology, the pathogenesis, and then developing these treatments at the same time as we're defining the biology and even diagnostics. So I think it's been a remarkable road. Several compounds have emerged, as you noted, with remdesivir and corticosteroids. Several compounds we had great hope for, such as hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, that didn't pan out. And I think we have to continue to be systematic in properly assessing new therapies and be careful with what we want to be true versus what we can properly assess to know is true so we can bring proper benefit and risk management mitigation to our patients and our patient care. At the beginning of the outbreak in the United States, as we've discussed over the months, testing was not adequate. Where do we stand now in that regard? We're certainly in better shape than we were at the beginning, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. We currently have two classes of tests, the fairly sensitive tests that rely on nucleic acid amplification and the less sensitive antigen-based tests. Nucleic acid tests are slow and they're relatively expensive, while antigen testing can be very fast and far cheaper, but depending on the test, can miss a fair number of infections. We haven't really deployed cheap tests that, regardless of their sensitivity, could be performed frequently and repeatedly in workplaces and airports and any place where transmission could be reduced. And we don't have enough capacity for high sensitivity testing, which is important for patient care and high value settings. This really, I would say, is one of the big disappointments thus far, at least in the United States. We're nine months into the epidemic and we are able to test a fraction of the population that could benefit. It's clear that in other countries that have performed considerably more testing have put themselves in much better shape. And so I think we have a lot of catching up to do. I couldn't agree with you more, Eric, as we've been saying, 
for quite some time. My hope is that we test as we think we should, not as to what's available. And we've seen that certain communities, for example, some of the colleges I know in the region, have quite frequent testing programs that have really diminished active transmission on their campuses. And that's a couple of times a week in many of their populations. While other arenas may have a symptom-based testing, which is quite tricky because we know there's a lot of asymptomatic acquisition and associated transmission. And without being able to know who's positive now, so not only testing, but with a turnaround time that is actionable, usually within a day, if not sooner, it is hard to block those chains of transmission. But with any of this testing going to scale and being able to manage both the false positive and false negative aspects of testing, and not all tests are equal, make this a complicated arena to fully implement. But I think it's critically important if we wanna slow down transmission is to rapidly identify who is actively shedding virus so we can help diminish their creating future chains of transmission. Lindsay, I'd say that this is really an area of opportunity in many countries, including the US. This is a place where investments would pay off uh, very quickly. So I hope that this is some place where we do see big improvements. Eric, I completely agree. And I think that this is part of the key to opening society. And that's why I think we have to be very careful about how we get caught up in dialogue about responding to COVID or opening society. It's a false choice. It's misguided in my view. What we need to do is get back to business, but do it in an intelligent manner that uses proper public health principles and modern technology like testing and hopefully a vaccine to work synergistically to block transmission. We can't think, in my view, that by using science, we're somehow refusing to open society. That's nonsense. This is about how to open up commerce, interacting, education, all of the things that we normally want to do both for work and fun, but to do it intelligently to decrease the risk of transmission while getting back to normal. And I think testing is such an integral part of that. Another piece of that at the low tech end of the spectrum is social intervention. Where does the U.S. stand in that regard? I broaden that to beyond the U.S. and say that what we know about these sorts of interventions comes from not so much basic research, though there has been a lot on droplets and aerosol transmission, on survival of virus on fomites, on the physics of masking. The strongest evidence for masking and distancing and testing and contract tracing really is observational. It's that when these measures have been practiced very rigorously, viral transmission has dropped and in some places eliminated. And I just read yesterday about Taiwan, which hasn't had a case of local transmission in over 200 days. So it's really important to remember that these measures work and the more they're practiced, the less transmission occurs. That is not a lesson that has sunk in in many places and the US is certainly one of those. Steve, I apologize for getting a a, a little bit graphic, but if I had a diarrheal illness, would you want me to wash my hands before I interact with you? If I have a respiratory illness, don't you want me to not cough on you? And there we have to realize that many of our compatriots may have a silent respiratory illness which is what the asymptomatic acquisition and disease burden, if I can view it that way. There's no disease in the individual, but they may be replicating virus and therefore able to spread it. So I think we have to be careful about how we look at this. You know, all of our parents or moms told us wash our hands when they're dirty. If I am coughing or if I am brewing a respiratory illness, I think we need to think carefully about how I diminish infecting you those around us, and my community and family. And so I think we as a community need to think about this. Right now, we know that there are hundreds of thousands, probably millions of Americans, people in our country, who are likely infected and transmitting. And I say that because we're diagnosing 50 to 100,000 per day. So that 
over a period of two weeks where there may be an infectious period of days, if not longer, that there are likely many of us who are brewing this right now. And how do we diminish that transmission? And I think we should all think carefully about that, particularly for our family, friends, and the community around us, and how do we diminish infecting them, which is the risk. So given all of that, given what we know now, what do you see happening in the near future? I'm afraid that's an easy question, Steve. As long as we keep doing what we're doing, the case rates are going to rise. Changes with the U.S. won't happen with the election results. Even if there's a change of the administration, it doesn't happen until late in January. And there hasn't been evidence that there have been many positive moves. So no matter what happens, it's going to take a while to institute change. And when that change occurs, there'll be a significant delay. Right now, the best scenario is that we get a vaccine that works or hopefully multiple vaccines that work. And if they're ideal, that would be great. But remember, they won't be available for several months. They won't be widely available, at least to many groups that need to get them and certainly not available to everyone for a while. And we still have a lot of work to do to figure out the logistics of distributing these hypothetical vaccines. So we've got a little ways to go and work to do. If in the worst case, the vaccines aren't effective, we're going to have to use the measures that we have not been instituting that well in this country that we should have been using all along. But it's important to remember that these are also slow. It takes a very long time from the start of instituting very strict transmission precautions to seeing a decrease and eventually, hopefully, an elimination or near elimination of disease. So we won't see those benefits for months either. So for now, I think my best advice is to not buy non-refundable cruise tickets. Eric, I think you raise a very important point. What's going on today? we don't see the impact of that for two to four weeks or longer. So unless we change our behavior today, we shouldn't be surprised that the illness we see two to four weeks from now continues to accelerate because what we're doing is no different than two to four weeks ago. And then as we move into the winter and changes in how we socialize and interact, that may further increase the risk of accelerating transmission. So I think we have to get into the mindset that for us to prevent transmission, interventions we do today take a month to kick in. And what we've seen with routine public health interventions in other parts of the world is they really can work if used properly. Therefore, I look at a vaccine as a way to augment routine public health interventions. Hopefully we can apply them immediately, realizing we won't see the benefit for a month, but we need that benefit as quickly as possible, given the burden of illness that we are seeing, our hospitals filling up, our ICU beds becoming limited. And that, in my view, is likely to get worse in the next two to four weeks because we've not done anything to slow it down so that the acceleration of illness, I'm worried, will truly continue to accelerate. And will our healthcare system be able to tolerate it? And in many parts of the country, I'm fearful it may not. So the message I would really want to implore to our community is, can we please implement routine public health measures today, trying to slow down the complications two to four weeks from now? Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Eric.